Well, hello everybody. This is Aaron. Welcome back to the Retro Hack Shack After Hours, my second channel. And yeah, if you watch my last channel where I struggled with several motherboards trying to get an old uh, Pentium class computer up and running, you will know that I was ultimately unsuccessful. Things kept going wrong, but I haven't given up yet. This is kind of a part two because when I was at eWaste, I found this. It is a Micron from about the same era, should be somewhere in the Pentium class, I think. And I'm really excited to see if I can give this one more try uh, to get a PC up and running so that I can test floppies and do other stuff. But mainly it's just a PC to test floppies with. Um, so yeah, here we are. I guess this is round two coming up on the Retro Hack Shack After Hours. Round two, fight. Just as a reminder, this is a continuation of the last video I did on Retro Hack Check After Hours where I was trying to build a PC to test floppies. And yeah, it didn't go so well, but I have tons of floppies to test. Floppies here, floppies there, more floppies, more floppies, some zip disks, more floppies. Yeah, I just have tons of them. I wanna test them and get rid of the bad ones and free up some space, maybe donate these to some other retro enthusiasts. So, okay, let's see what I found for today. So as I said, I was able to find this Micron PC at eWaste the next week when I went, and uh, I am really hopeful for this. This is a very clean box. It's got a few scuff marks on it, nothing that uh, is too serious. It does have a plastic, I know that sounds like metal because there's metal on the inside, but it's plastic. It's a plastic case. It does have a steel chassis on the inside, but the case itself is plastic and that makes this thing much lighter and easier to move around. So I'm glad for that. Taking a closer look, we have the Micron uh, logo there on the front. And right there, you can see the Intel inside with the Pentium logo. And so that's what makes me think this is uh, almost certainly a Pentium class motherboard on the inside here. But then as we look up, you can see that this is a mid tower case. There's a CD-ROM there and this, which is, this is the first one I've ever found of this uh, half height, but dual drive chassis. So it's got a three and a uh, three and a half inch uh, drive in there and a five and a quarter inch drive all in the same unit. So if that's working, I am gonna be super pleased because that is certainly gonna help me fit uh, enough drives in here to be able to test a lot of different formats if both of those are working. So there was actually two of these and I didn't realize it had this dual floppy drive, half height drive here until uh, I had gotten home with this. And then when I found out, I went back the next day, they had two of these and I went back to find it and it was already gone. They had already sent it off to be smashed. So that was a big bummer, but I'm glad I have one of these and I'm really hoping that that is working. Taking a quick look at the back here, we have the power supply, of course. This is interesting, product of Idaho. So maybe Micron was making their PCs. Maybe they had a factory in Idaho or something, or maybe or it was a reseller that slapped this on there. I don't know, but uh, yeah. So I guess this came from Idaho at some point. On the back here, we have a couple of serial ports, a parallel port, uh, uh, PS2 connectors for mouse and keyboard in here, video card, modem. Of course, modems were uh, requisite uh, uh, cards to have in these things back in the day, because that's how you would connect to AOL or, or whatever your internet provider of choice would be. A really nice networking card. We'll see what kind this is when I open it up, but it has RJ11, um, the AUI port here, and B and C all in one card. Winner, winner, chicken dinner for that. And an interesting sound card here. So we'll have to see what that is. So this PC is basically fully loaded and ready to go. It's got everything that you would need in this Micron case. Now, you might notice this little bar that goes across here. That's for stabilization because this is, as I said, a plastic case and you can see it does flex a bit. What's cool about this too is 
It's got this little thumb screw up here. So in order to take the case off, the, the side doesn't come out like it would in a modern case, nor does the whole thing uh, have screws, you know, along the sides here as it would in one of those old all metal steel cases. But because this has a plastic case on it, you can take out this thumb screw and then it's got these little uh, clips down here. So if we press those in and pull, this whole thing should come off. And there it goes. Bada bing, bada boom. It does have shielding on the inside of this case. That's what was rattling before. Just a quick look at the inside of this mid tower case. You can see uh, things are pretty tight up here in terms of cables because of the dual floppy drive up here at the top. So this whole area is pretty tight. There's no hard drive installed and that's okay. I'll probably be using a flash drive on this thing anyway, or CF card on this thing to get it up and running. But uh, yeah, it's always nice when there's a hard drive. In this case, no archeology span really to be done in terms of operating systems and uh, you know folders full of porn and all that. This motherboard has three PCI slots and five 16-bit ISA slots. The other thing that it has in it, and it may be hard to see, uh, but it has six slots for memory. There's two over here on this side, and then there's four over here. So I'll have to see what the maximum amount of memory you can put in this thing is, but we could really perhaps max this out. I also see on the inside an uh, Intel chipset here. I always think that that's... A means quality and maybe a little bit pricier uh, options. I think Micron was known to be one of the pricier computer resellers back at the back in the day. So, you know, maybe they opted for a higher class motherboard, which means I have a better chance of success here in getting this thing up and running the way I want. And it also looks like it has some additional cache up here. I know that's going to be impossible to see because it's all dark, but it looks like I might be able to install a little bit more cache and maybe eke out a little bit more performance for this thing if needed. Oh, crap. Yeah, the other thing I'm noticing is, is it does have, this does have a Dallas chip uh, right there. It's kind of down in this part of the motherboard. So that Dallas chip, no doubt the battery in that is bad. So bummer, we're gonna have to replace that for sure. The last computer I had with one of those Dallas chipsets uh, uh, or real-time clocks and uh, CMOS batteries in it, um, the last one I had when I, when I booted, it did not let, it wouldn't save anything, even on a, on a warm boot when I just hit reset. Yeah, that's gonna have to be uh, a little bit of a job, but I think I've got a solution for that. So the first thing I want to do with this right now is just test for any shorts uh, on the power rails. But here we go. So I'm just going to leave everything intact. I'm hoping that I can at least do a test run without pulling everything out. But certainly this is going to need a good cleaning. In fact, if I look down in here, oh yeah, that is all dust there. So I am going to have to take everything out, but I just want to do just a quick test. If the power rails are good, fire it up and uh, see if things are working. This is the 12 volt rail and that looks good. You can see the resistance is climbing as the uh, capacitors are charging. Uh, this is the three volt rail, nothing, no shorts, five volt rail. Uh, that's not good. 25 ohms, so, you gotta be kidding me. This is the same thing that happened with that other Kate, with that other computer that I had. And I, if you remember, if you watch that, I had to swap out the power supply because the power supply had either bad caps or whatever. And it, on the five volt rail, there was very low resistance. That shouldn't be that low. Let me just check and make sure. No, definitely, definitely 25 ohms there. Do I have another bad power supply? You gotta be kidding me. All right, well, the way that you tell if it's the power supply or something on the board is to remove the, uh, Remove the, the uh, connections to the motherboard. Now the motherboard is separate from the, uh, from the power supply. Although, you know, I guess we could, there could be something on one of these drives because the drives are still plugged in. Let's just go ahead and see what the five volt and it rail is doing now with uh, the motherboard being disconnected. Oh, okay. Look at that climb. Yeah, that's good. That's what I would expect is you know you get you get a what looks like a short at first it's not it's just because the capacitor is there and then as you continue to measure and the capacitor starts charging up that resistance goes up just like it is so 
the 5 volt rail on the power supply itself is actually good and we can infer from that that the power supply or that the connections on the uh, CD ROM and floppy drive are also not shorted because if there was that's all connected so that we'd be seeing a short there so the power supply is good these drives don't have shorts on them but there's something on the motherboard that is causing uh something close to a short and I want to find out what that is so I'm noticing here that there's on two of these boards, especially the, the video card and this sound card in here, they have a lot of tantalum capacitors. Now, I would expect those tantalums to be on the 12 volt rail, not the five volt rail. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments below, but usually I associate tantalums on boards like this with 12 volt rails. So, but I guess they could be on five volt rails, right? So, okay, so let's, uh, let's start just disconnecting some of these cards and see if that short or near short goes away. I'm just gonna take the video card out. Nope, no change, 28 ohms. Okay, so let's take out the modem. I wouldn't think there'd be any problems with the modem, but never know, anything could be shorted on these old systems. Nope, still 28 ohms. Next comes the Oh, network card. There it comes. Nope, still 28.4. I know that went by quickly, but I saw it. Oh, man. Maybe this is a problem on the board. Let's take out the sound card. Hopefully the problem is on the sound card, because if it's on the motherboard, I'm going to be really disappointed, and you might just see me throw this through the window. Oh. Yeah, this goes, you can, it comes up just a little bit around 500 ohms and then it quickly goes away and just says, just says open from there. So the problem must be something on this sound card. Let's just take a quick look at these cards before I put the video card back in and try to power this thing on. Okay, here's the video card. This is a Diamond Stealth 64 PCI and date is 1994 right there. And this says Vision S3 Vision 964. So if my memory is correct, this is actually a pretty decent card. And as you can see, there's empty memory sockets here. So potentially we could upgrade this card with some more memory if that would add any kind of performance. So next we have the uh, modem here. As I said, there's not a whole lot you can do with these anymore. But, uh, you know, you, you would if you didn't have a modem, you weren't getting your uh, AOL instant messenger going. Uh, this is a US robotics modem. So I believe this is a 14.4K modem. So this definitely would have been back in the day. Uh, that would have been, you know, pretty, pretty good speed. And here's that networking card, which I may make use of if it's still working. This is an Intel 816 LAN adapter. Like I said, it's got all the varieties of connectors that you could want in a LAN adapter. So yeah, I might actually make use of this. And it has an empty boot ROM here. And I'm wondering if, I think on some of these network cards, you can reuse this to put like the... Uh, the BIOS from the IDE to XT project, you can put that BIOS on here, I think, and make use of that without actually having that card in your system, but you can use that to help boot things and things. So, and last but not least, we have the problem child here, this sound card, and it says Logitech up here, 1993. I believe this was a, what did they call it? A Wave Man or something like that? Or Wave sound card, Logitech Wave? Anyway, this is this is where the, the problem lies, I believe. So I am going to leave this out of the system until I can do some more testing. For me, immediately, I'm thinking maybe the problem is over here on these larger caps. There's not a whole lot of, like I said, there's a lot of tantalum caps here. But in terms of large electrolytics, there's just these these caps over here. So, you know, I might try to just replace those three caps. It would only take a few minutes and see if I can get this thing up and running. And of course, there's also dust in this car, too. Woo, really dusty. Clean on the outside, dusty on the inside. Okay, here we go. I've got a keyboard monitor hooked up, just the video card in there. Let's turn it on and see what happens. Oh, I'm getting keyboard lights. That's a good sign, I think. Hey, here we go. Nice, Pentium 90. We've got a Pentium 90 and 40 megs of RAM. Awesome. It's got 256K of cache. SRAM, I'm wondering if I can double that at least to 512 or maybe more. That would be cool. 
Um, okay, here we go. System battery is dead. Replace and run setup. Real-time clock error. So, yeah, I'll bet you anything. Um, here, let's just try this. Let's just go into setup. Warning, CMOS checksum is invalid. That's because we've got a dead Dallas chip. Uh, let's just try to change the, uh, the diskette type here. It really doesn't matter because I'm sure this isn't going to hold it. But I think that's probably a 1.2 meg, five and a quarter inch drive in that uh, combined drive up there. So let's just go ahead and save this and save changes and exit. Changes have been saved. Continue. I'll almost guarantee you when this thing boots back up, notice I didn't do a hard reboot. So power has not been turned off. Go into setup. Yeah, CMOS checksum is invalid. Yeah, they didn't save it at all. So that is a big bummer. Now in the past, what I've shown is I've shown actually um, that you can, you can fix those Dallas chips by adding a lithium battery to the top of it. You have to like use a Dremel tool and uh, get the get the uh, plastic and epoxy, you know, kind of scrape down so that you can get to the pins that are hidden underneath there and then attach some wires to a battery and you can resurrect it that way. There's also another great option, which is to buy the Necroware um, ones that he has built and you can find those online. I looked for those and they were like, I don't know, the ones I found on eBay were like 30 bucks or something, which I thought was kind of ridiculous. You shouldn't have to pay that much for those, but so what I did was I just did a check to see if I could find these uh, replacements, because you can still get brand new replacements from places like DigiKey where I got these. So this is a Dallas real-time clock replacement. It is a 12C887 plus. So the original the original uh, real-time clock, Dallas real-time clocks were 12.87s. And then later on, they put out 12.887s. This is a 12C887, which has the century bit in there. So like for Y2K stuff. So this would be, you know, for whatever reason, if you had an application that couldn't handle Y2K in software, I think this would allow it to handle that rollover a little bit better. So um, yeah, I just got these from DigiKey. They were cheaper than getting those Necroware replacements. And I haven't tried actually um, using these. Now, these, if you're wondering, well, like, well, are, is the battery dead in these Dallas chips? Well, actually, no, because the way that these are built, they turn off the, the clock on the inside of those, these chips until it detects power on a certain pin. I can't remember which one, but once it detects power on that, on that pin, then it goes ahead and starts the uh, clock inside this chip at that point, and that starts draining the battery. But until then, these until the first boot up, the first power up, these should be holding their charge uh, with no problem. So yeah, let's go ahead and break one of these out and get it popped in and see if it actually works. While I'm getting this out, the thing I didn't mention, I should have mentioned earlier, is that this also has a fan cage here for airflow. And in the case, there is airflow... Um, holes so that you could put a fan in here. I think if I take off this screw right here, this cage will pop out. You can mount a fan on the inside and increase the, the amount of airflow that this thing has. And I think there's also a place to mount a fan up front here. So in case things do get hot, it's nice to know I can easily add some fans to this thing. And this is indeed a DS12887A. So the chips that I got, I believe should be compatible compatible replacements for this thing. Whoops, it just came right out. I bent the pins on it. Okay, so this time we have a checksum bad run setup, but we don't have a real-time clock error. That's exactly what I would expect to see. Let's just go ahead into the setup and let's change this to what I think it should be which is a 1.2 meg, five and a quarter inch drive. And uh, yeah, let's just try that. Pentium 90, testing the RAM. Operating system not found. All right, cool. Well, let's, uh, let me clean this drive here real quick. We'll see if, uh, see if this drive is working. I hope, really hope it is. Yep, it's trying to read the drive, which is awesome. So I've got the cleaning disk in there right now. But the fact that that came on, opened up the drive and tried to, or tried to open the, slide the hatch and open the uh, 
drive up is a good sign. So let me just do that one more time. Okay, this time we'll put the DOS 6.22 disc in. Come on, baby, give me DOS. Sounds like it's reading it. Starting MS-DOS. So far, so good. So at this point, I went ahead and tested the other drive as well, the five and a quarter inch part of this combination drive, and it tested well too. I imagine that these two drives probably didn't get a lot of use since CD-ROMs were becoming more and more popular around this time and people were using floppy disks less and less. I will say though that it is a little strange to be using a push button on a five and a quarter inch drive instead of the little lever that you would normally use. I also found a Chinon 360K drive out of my collection and tested it, cleaned it, lubed it, all of those things just to make sure that it was working well. And now that it is, I think I'm ready to move on to the next step and see if I can get more than two drives working on this machine. And if you're wondering about my hand, uh, yeah, I've had yet another surgery. Uh, since I'm a type one diabetic, I'm susceptible to trigger finger and uh, I, I, mine is bad enough that I have to have it operated on. So yeah, so I just had that done. Uh, you know the drill if you've been watching this channel for a while, this will disappear probably in the next video or so and I'll have a little, little Band-Aid or a scar or something. And if you watch previous videos, you can see the various scars on the, uh, the hands that I've had done already where I've actually had this procedure done in the past. So as you, if you've ever wondered why I've got those scars, uh, it's because of these trigger release procedures that I have to have done, unfortunately. Okay, now that all my drives are working, it's time to answer the question about how uh, I'm going to get more than two drives working at a time because this computer only supports two drives. Whereas the earlier uh, IBM PC, PC XT, and I believe the AT all supported four drives, on their controller card. So you could have two internal and two external. In fact, if you go watch my one of my very first videos I did on this channel, I showed how to get an external GoTech drive working on an IBM 5150 using those two extra drives that were uh, possible on that controller. Well, we can't do that with this PC. So it comes down to using one of these external cards. This is just an example, but you can see here, it's got two floppy drive connectors here, and it's got a number of options, including setting the floppy IO dressing for an alternate address. So what you can do in the BIOS is you can actually disable, uh, you can do one of two things. You can either use this alternate address so it doesn't conflict with the one built into the BIOS, or you can disable the floppy drive controller in some BIOSes and then keep this as the, the regular floppy drive address and then, you, and then just use these two instead of using the ones that are built into the PC. Now this one, I don't know if you can see it, but right there it says floppy tape. So I did a few tests with this card and I could only ever get the two ports working that are on the floppy drive one and two up here. I could never get anything working using this, um, floppy tape adapter for the third and the fourth drives. So uh, yeah, this card here doesn't seem like anyway it's gonna work for a four drive system. By the way, my suspicion on this card is that probably this floppy tape, it may have a different pinout or is addressed in a different way than a regular floppy drive. So maybe it's expecting some a certain proprietary hardware there on that connector and that's why it's not working. However, I also have this card. Now these cards were all part of a big ISA card haul that I covered in a recent episode. So if you haven't seen that, you might wanna go take a look at it because I had over 50 ISA cards that I found at eWaste and it was kind of difficult to go through and identify all of them, but you guys helped a lot in the comments. So I appreciate everyone that suggested uh, what those cards might be. But this one clearly has floppy one and two and floppy three and four on this header. And then there's a, a spot for a um, RLL disc, which is kind of a cousin of, of the MFM discs, hard disks. And so we won't be using this, but we will be using these two ports up here for the floppy drives. This one also has a number of options on it. These options allow you to disable uh, the floppy, disable the hard drive, set a different address, 
So I'll be setting those accordingly over on these jumpers over here. Now, since the BIOS is only going to recognize the first two drives, we're going to need some help from software in order to get it to recognize drives three and four. I found some really good information over here on this website, and I'll put a link to this website in the description below. Basically, there are two software packages you can use to help you recognize the third and fourth drive. One is S drive, which there's not very much information here, admittedly. And the other one is a driver called DC2. These two software drivers will help get the system to recognize drives three and four and help make this thing work. I had a really hard time finding both of these drivers, so I'll upload both of them as well as some documentation on S drive to archive.org. So if you want to find these easily, I will put a link in the description below to the archive.org page where you could find these. If you don't want to mess with drivers or if you don't have a card that supports four floppy drives, you could always hook up a toggle switch to toggle between the two drive types as a backup option. As you can see here in my config sys, I had to change a few things. I had to add this last drive equals Z, and then I'm using both, I tried this DC2.sys uh, driver, which did not work, but it requires these other lines to get the uh, uh, disks added. And what I'm using is this S drive.sys here um, with these parameters, and I tried a bunch of different configurations here but this S drive seems to work the best for me. When I first booted up the computer with the configuration and the card in place, it seemed like everything was working fine according to the information that I put in the config.sys file. However, once I got booted up, none of the drives were accessible. So I pulled out the card and lo and behold, I found this little piece of detritus wedged down here in the pins. I don't know if this is conductive or what, but I decided I better go ahead and pull this out and get the pins and the edge connectors all cleaned up with a little bit of isopropyl alcohol. Once I got the card reinstalled and rebooted, now it seems like everything is working fine and I can actually access all three drives that I have connected at this point with no problem. I would really like to add a 720K uh, three and a half inch drive because that would really kind of round things out in terms of all the different drive types that I primarily want to work with. But I don't have a 720K three and a half inch drive except in my Tandy 1000 and I don't want to use that one. So I'll keep my eye out for a 720K disc, but I can substitute for now a GoTech which will at least let me be able to read images from whatever size uh, image I want to, essentially. And this will also just be a great way to copy disks back and forth. If I can find a good image, then I can actually make a physical copy, at least on these three media types. Like I said, I'll be looking for that 720K one. But uh, yeah, let's add this in as the fourth drive. Um, and to do that, I just have to rem out this line and unrem this line. So now I have four drives defined. I'm going to define this as a 1.4 uh, meg, three and a half inch floppy drive for now, but I could switch this up at any time. What I'm not sure is if I define this as 1.4 and then try to put a, let's say a 360K image on here, I think it auto uh, does some auto magic here to make it, when you when it reads that it's a 360K image, it'll like automatically adjust. So I, I'm not sure if hard coding it here, which I have to do in order to get another drive added, I'm not sure if that'll mess up the GoTech, but um, I'll define it as the larger drive type right, right now and then see if it'll read smaller disks. And I've got a little tray here so that when I go to add this in later, I can add that in uh, right there. So that'll be perfect. Okay, it's a bit of a mess, but let's see if the GoTech is working. Okay, so it didn't complain about the 1.4 megabyte drive there. So that should be E. Let's go ahead and hit E. Let me see what's on here first. Okay, so this is the Windows 98 SE boot disk, which is definitely a 1.4 uh, meg drive. So let's go to E, see if it'll read it. Yes, well, I'm in there anyway. Let's see if it'll give me a directory. Yep, it does. Perfect. 
Okay, now I think what I have in there now is a 360K image, and it's the uh, uh, MS-DOS 5 disk 1. So if I go to E now, let's see what happens. Yeah, it's not going to work, actually. So unfortunately, I'm stuck to using images of that size. Of course, if I wanted to, I can just go back and change in the config.sys. I can change that to whatever size drive I want, but because it's actually changing that drive type or setting that drive type explicitly, it's not gonna let me bounce back and forth. So that gives me at least four drives, but I think I can do one better than that. So I've actually got, sitting over here, excuse my reach, a zip disk. So this is an internal zip disk, and I can add this because I've got one hard drive here on the IDE cable, and then I can add something else and put that in this slot right there, like that, since my three and a half inch drive is up here in this larger bay. So now I've got room to add this, and that'll really round things out very nicely. One unfortunate thing that I learned, and I'm not exactly sure why, is the second IDE channel is not working. I was testing out the CD-ROM drive and I, it wasn't working and I didn't know why. So um, I tested it a bunch of times and it's not working, but when I hook this up to as a slave to the primary IDE, it does work. And there's nothing in the BIOS that I can find that turns off the secondary IDE controller. I also tested removing the card that the floppy drives are connected to since it did have that RLL interface on it. I thought that might be a conflict, but that didn't make any difference either. Uh, one other option would be is if I had a, uh, a dual floppy card that also had an IDE controller on it, I might be able to use that and hook that up to something else in this system to get more, more devices out of it using a secondary IDE. But I'm not gonna need a CD-ROM in this particular system for what I wanna do with it. And maybe later, if I wanna play games, turn this into a gaming machine or something like that, I can add this back in, but uh, honestly, I'm not gonna need it. I'd rather have more drive types in here, floppy drive and removable drive types in here to test with than have the CD-ROM in here. And I don't have to use it to, uh, to move fi files back and forth because I've got the flash card, which makes it really easy to move files back and forth. And I'm gonna hook this up to the network eventually as well, which will let me transfer files off on and off the network. So I think for now, I can just go ahead and take out this CD-ROM, which does work, but it just doesn't, for some reason, the secondary IDE uh, uh, controller doesn't work on this machine. So this is gonna go in storage. Now I did find the 6. whatever, I think it's 6.0 version of the zip utilities, which comes with some DOS utilities. So I've got those in a folder here and it comes with a guest application that you can run and it should automatically discover the, uh, the zip disk and set it up once I have it set up here on this system. And then we can have five different things going on at the same time, which will be pretty awesome. All right, so I've got this set up as a slave. I've got a zip disk in here. And when I turned it on the first couple of times uh, I was messing around with it, it was clicking twice and it wasn't scanning the disk when it powered up. So I'm a little bit worried that this zip disk might be, the zip drive might be marginal. <clears throat> we'll see, right now it's clicking once, which it should to open the latch and it's scanning the disk. So. Uh, not sure this unit might be either slightly defective or might have some lubrication issues or something going on in it. I don't know. So I'm a little bit skeptical of the drive, but let's just go ahead and run the guest program and see if it will set up a drive letter. This does take a while. Okay, now here's a problem. So it found it, and but it set it up as letter D which I've already got a drive letter D here, which is my, this one up here, the 360K five and a quarter inch drive. So let's just go to D and see what happens. Uh, I heard something happen. Oh yeah, it's actually working. Of course the problem is now, for some reason it's seeing it as D, maybe because it doesn't recognize um, the extra drives. So it's it's picking letter D. So I think what I need to do is, I think there's an option to create a 
uh, to map it to a particular letter. Yeah, so I think this is the option letter equals. Let's just choose a kind of random letter. I'll choose letter equals R. And let's see if it sets this up as a different letter that doesn't conflict with this D drive. Still says finding a drive letter though. That's not good. No, it set it up as D again. Okay. Um, these drivers are pretty late. Let me try a different version of the driver. Okay, I found some older drivers, some older zip drive, zip drive drivers. Um, and this is, I think, version 5.4, so we'll try this. Okay, so let's first try this just using the guest command and see if it detects all of these drives and chooses the right drive letter. Again, this is using the 5. I think 4, yeah, 5.4 version of the drivers. Oh, there we go. And now I don't know why it didn't pick G. That's kind of weird. For some reason it didn't pick G, it picked F. But that's okay. If it works, uh, I'll take it. Let's do... There we go. It's working. I transferred this Doom on here uh, a while ago, and uh, so I, kn I knew what was on this. So I knew if it read Doom that it would be okay. So we can go into Doom and just run a directory. Oh yeah, it's super, super fast compared to the floppy drives and looks like it's working well. So that's another way I can transfer files on and off this machine or set up a disk to use on a Mac or, or whatever. Now I'll have that for access in here as well. Now I noticed when I first set this up that it uh, took a long time to come up with that drive letter and I changed some things so that it would, it would happen a lot uh, quicker. So there's a file in here. Here it is right here, guest.ini. That's where the configuration for that guest program is. And I changed some things to make this run faster. So first of all, I turned scan off um, so that it wouldn't look for ASPI managers existing because that takes a little bit. And then it was running every single one of these uh, uh, driver commands here to get this thing to run. And um, I only now am loading the one that I need instead of trying all of them. The way I found which one I needed, which was this ASPI ATAP.sys, is I just looked at uh, the use the mem command slash p slash c, and after this is after this was loaded and working, uh, after I ran the guest command successfully, I ran this mem command and I saw right down here ASPI ATAP was loaded into memory. So I knew that that was the one that this one was using and all the rest of them were just not needed. Now, of course, if I ever hook up a SCSI or parallel zip drive, then it wouldn't work anymore because I have, I have remmed out those drivers for those different drives. But I don't plan on doing that, obviously, since I'm gonna be installing this one permanently in this machine. So now, because I've remmed out all those other drivers, the when you type in guest, it loads really, really quickly. And uh, uh, probably about, oh, I'd say eight times faster than it was doing before, because it was trying all those other ones. So now what I've done in my autoexec.bat is I've just added a command here to this uh, guest command with the 5.4 drivers, it's in this iOmega folder. And so every time the computer starts, it'll go out and look and see if this is attached. And if it is, it will assign a proper drive letter. Uh, for some reason, 5.4 works and 6.0 must have had some problems or something. So in this case, older is better. Okay, I think it's time to turn this off and see if I can get all the drives actually mounted in the chassis. Now, one problem is I don't have enough rails to get everything mounted inside the case here. So I measured the existing rails and then created some new ones in a CAD program and brought them over to my 3D printer. This got a couple of rails printed up really quickly and I hope they fit. All right, and here's the rail. It finally finished 3D printing. What are the chances that this will work on the first go? 3D prints almost never uh, work. Usually you have to make some adjustment or something, but this is the, this is the rail I made. And let's just see if it lines up, the holes line up here. Yeah, they do indeed. So this is looking really, really good. And the end of this is just where, about where it's supposed to be to uh, when I compare this to the other drives over there. Um, the, the, that's exactly where it should be actually. So yeah, let me get these on and if this works, it'll be a miracle. <laughs> there we go. And then they're a little tight. Will they click into place for the win? Yes, they do. Look at that. Wow. 
it's not perfect, but I mean, come on, for something that you can make by yourself, that is fantastic. If anybody wants the uh, the files for these, I can put them on Thingiverse or something like that. I'm not sure though, because it's like really particular to this this case right here, but if anybody's looking for these and found my video through a search and, and wants these, just let me know. I'll put them in, in the description or something like that, or put them in the comments. But yeah, working first time. One hit wonder, baby. And you can also see I've oriented these now so that I've got uh, biggest typical capacity to lowest. So if I ever do get that 720K drive that I can put in here, then I'll have 1.44, 1 1.2, 720, and 360 in descending order. And I think I'm also gonna change up my configuration. So um, it'll be A, B, D, E. So it'll go down in the alphabet and I'll put some, maybe some nice labels on there as well. After getting the front bezel back on the case, I was able to go ahead and give this thing a quick clean with some Windex. There was one troublesome spot over here that I actually had to break out the melamine sponge for, but it wasn't a big deal. It just required a little bit of elbow grease. And because it was a plastic cover to this case, I didn't have to worry too much about taking off any paint or anything like that, which I normally would be concerned about with this melamine sponge. All right, so we're finally at the point where I can actually test out what I built this machine for, which is to test disks. I've got a ton of them. So uh, I'm gonna be using a tool called Format QM. This is version 2.02. And this utility is super handy because it's got you know just the right <laughs> uh, adjustments that you need. You can basically set it to continuously go one disk after another because it can detect whether a disk has been inserted or not. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but yeah, it also supports apparently up to 12 drives according to the documentation. So you can go down here and uh, it kind of does some, some auto detection. Like it can kind of see like, oh, I, uh, you know, when I go down here to drive B, which is this one, which is the 1.2 meg one, it says, oh, is this 1.2 meg or 360K? Um, but it knows it's not a 1.44. So yeah, drive D can be anything and it knows that and even, it even uh, recognizes that it can do, a, it might be a Mac hard drive. So I don't know how they know this, but it's pretty cool that it can detect this stuff. And of course this only has one option, a 360K drive, which is this one down here. So yeah, any of these drives now can be checked and formatted. Um, and there's some other cool uh, options here as well. So if you set it to not ask for volume labels, which I am going to do actually, um, it will just continuously, it won't stop. So it'll format a disc, it'll beep, take the disc out, put another disc in, and it'll start all over again. So that's pretty cool. Check for data, yes, just in case, you know, you don't wanna put a disc in that has data on it. Uh, warm format, that would be if you just wanna rewrite the allocation table, um, probably not a good idea if you're actually want to check the surfaces and stuff for to make sure that these discs can be formatted. Um, verify yes, format verify passes. You know you can you can do multiple passes of formatting. Allowed flawed diskettes no. So what that'll do is as soon as it detects that there's a flaw on the diskette, it will stop at that point, won't go on, and it'll say you know go to the next one basically. So yeah, this is a really cool. Um, program. So let's just go ahead and I'll leave that out for now. This is the disc that was failing before because I demagnetized it or magnetized it with a screwdriver. Um, so let's just check that disc now and see if it, whoops, uh, see if it is uh, good or bad. So I hit F10 to begin. So this one is ready to format. So let's go ahead and put that in. Should detect it. It's formatting. Uh, drive B. These are all discs that I can get rid of. There's nothing really on them. Let's just take that out. It says ready to format. Put it in, did it go in? Okay, so here we go. So A, A is done, right? And then it moved on to B, but I've got stuff on B. So it's, it's it, because I told it to check and see if there's any data on there, now it came up and stopped right there because there's, there's uh, uh, data on the disk. And that's exactly what I wanted to do. And then I can just hit yes to format the disk and it goes on to this one. It'll skip this one because I haven't inserted a new disc yet. It hasn't detected a new disc has been put in. And then it would go on to E and it would stop there because 
I've got that set up as a uh, just a boot disk, right, with command.com on it, but it would recognize that. So pretty cool, I must say. I really like this uh, setup, and now I can have this running in the corner and just be checking all of the hundreds of disks that I have for errors and things like that. The ones that I know that don't have anything that I want to keep on them. Now you might be asking, what am I going to do when I run out of disks to test when I've gone through them all? Well, I may set this up as a little gaming machine too. Maybe throw a sound blaster in there, a better video card, um, you know, play with that a little bit, add some cash to the motherboard. If you want to see a video about that, let me know. Complete, no errors. Woohoo! Yeah, E appears to have to uh, uh, be formatted already. So cool. The uh, if you want to see me do a video about uh, you know setting this up as more of a like maxing it out in terms of memory and and cache and all that good stuff, let me know in the comments below, and I will put a link to more PC related videos that you can browse after you're done with this one. So thanks to all my patrons and check out a playlist that I'll link up at the top, and I'll see you in the next video. End of line.